Hi, I'm Hans, and up until recently, I was pretty glad that C++ didn't have automated garbage collection. And that's because in most implementations, you've got almost no control over it whatsoever. Um, it will run when it runs, and that when it runs may not be when you want it to run. It might be at a performance critical time, and it can take, you don't know how long it's going to take. So if you're doing anything related to video or gaming or anything that needs to happen in real time, that's a problem because you can get a visible glitch as the garbage collector runs. Your game just pauses for a moment and okay, fraction of a second, but you can see it. So I've always been glad until I started writing an FTP server, which I'd never done before, but that's okay. I've got the network programming book, I've got the internet and I've got a brain so I can figure it out. Um, and that's when I hit problems that wouldn't have existed if, I, if, if there was a garbage collector. So, um, let, let me explain how, th how this works. I went for the classic event-driven model because it's a very efficient way of handling multiple connections in parallel. So if you're not familiar with that, this is how it works. You've usually got this tight loop um, where you go through, unless the user quits, you keep going through this loop. You check, is there, event? is there an event? If there's an event, you call its callback function. There's a pointer to a callback function. It runs and then goes back. you go back and you process all the existing events and then you go back to the top. And usually in here, there's a, actually a, an intermediate step that I skipped just to make it easier to see the understand the diagram where it will wait for the next event to come in. So you're not going through the loop, wasting processing time while it's doing nothing. Anyway, here's an example of how things can go wrong. Uh, let's say a guy called Joe connects to my server and requests a file. So it goes in, calls the callback function. The callback function starts loading the file, which is done in a thread, in a worker thread, because file IO is not asynchronous uh, in nature. And then, but Joe's really, um, really, really impatient. So he kills the connection as this is happening. So this goes back into the loop, have an event. Yes, we have a new event that file has loaded. So it tries to call the callback function to send that file to Joe, but the connection's gone and we get a crash. So, okay, let's try to fix that. We will defer the delete. So we will move the de delete outside of this tight event loop. Uh, and now in this case, it would work. But let's just say Joe requests a new, fi new file. And this time it's not his fault, um, it's his router. His router has a, an obscure bug in its firmware and that bug kills the connection. So what happens is we go through start loading the file. It's a little bit bigger this time. We get through here, we get through, no more events. The connection is deleted. And then we get through to here and then that file is loaded and ready to be sent to Joe. Um, so the callback is called, but the object's still not there. So still crashes. And there are so many subtle interactions, especially with network programming. With network programming, you're dealing with, oh, s countless different systems and, and different operating systems, different routers, different networking hardware that can all operate, that, that they're all supposed to be standards compliant, but how people interpret the standards and, and subtle bugs and things changes how things behave. Anyway. So I'm sure you'll tell me, uh, you know, C++ is smart pointers. Why aren't you using them? Well, truth is I am, but there's this thing that smart pointers doesn't handle called the, the smart pointer loop where this object points to that one, that object points to that one. So it doesn't matter what happens. The shared pointer counts will always be at least one. So it'll never get down to zero. So none, neither of these objects will ever be deleted when they're no longer needed because they are pointing to each other and you can make it more complicated. You can have a bigger loop where object one points to object two to object three 
and then all the way back to object one. To handle this, you need to stick a weak pointer in there. So this is one that doesn't have its own, doesn't increment the count. So what happens here is then if object one is deleted or object two, then object three will be deleted as well because the counts can go down to zero. Now that sounds all well and good, but let's, let's bring it back to the simple case. There's, you still have to figure out ownership hierarchies. So basically everything, the ownership needs to be in the form of a tree where there's never a pointer back to a higher level object. It just takes time to do. Now, there are clear advantages, um, but I, I have a habit of using raw pointers rather than weak pointers. And the reason for that is it avoids the lock unlock overhead, which can be important for um, performance critical code. And it makes the code cleaner. You don't need to lock the object. However, you can end up with dangling pointers because yes, this object here can disappear and this raw pointer has no knowledge of that, uh, which is what's been happening. So, which means you need to be very, very careful about the order in which things are unlocked. And up until I wrote the FTP server, that's always been the case. So I've been able to go and get away with it. But this is an advanced, this is an example of what's called premature optimization. I never used the weak pointer first. I went straight to the raw pointer, even though I, I never tested whether it was actually needed, whether, whether it really was performance critical. For all I know, it couldn't matter because the other processing takes up so much time that the overhead of occasionally locking and unlocking or freak, even relatively frequently locking and unlocking these uh, weak pointers uh, is negligible. So my bad, that, that, that's, that's, uh, that's on me and I've certainly paid for it. Um, but if we had a full garbage collector, none of this would matter. Right? I wouldn't need to worry about the, the, the hierarchy of ownership. Although, let me stress, when you're programming, you do need to think about how your data is structured. But in this case, all that burden of figuring out which objects should point have a shared pointer, which objects should have a weak pointer, and let's make sure that things are allocated and deallocated in the correct order and outside the event limit, all of that would go away because all you need to do is delete all the references to that object and then the garbage collector will come in and clean them up later. And yes, the garbage collector can deal with pointer loops. And some say it's actually the biggest improvement in developer productivity um, in recent years. It's, it's why languages that have garbage collection, they tend to be able to write code faster. It's, they're not really writing code faster. They just don't have to deal with the minutiae of managing the memory uh, of individual objects like that uh, because it's, it's done automatic. So yeah, I, I wish C++ had it, but optional and, and with a bit more control so that I can keep, keep that garbage collector under control. But I definitely, now that I've done some network programming, I can see the value of it. Uh, anyway, I hope this was useful. Um, if you want to see more like this, as with everything else, please subscribe and I will see you next time.